Today on Cross Defense, given that I got a mailer from Luther Classical College, we're talking more about Sunday school, just like we did last week. We're going to learn about pastors and why they care so much about Christian kids and their education, and how the vocational duty of parents is the answer to all that ails our society. Mom and Dad, you guys are the solution. You matter. Find out about this and so much more in today's show. Welcome to Cross Defense, where our goal is to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul all with God's Word. I'm your host, the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, your outpost of orthodoxy on the Lost Coast, your bastion of biblical belief behind the Redwood Curtain, your faithful Christian home in Humboldt County, where, as we say here on KFUO Radio, Christ is for you anytime, anywhere. It is truly the case on KFUO, and it is truly the case at the home of the Winged Lion Studio, as it has been since 1893, when the first Missouri Synod missionary fulfilled the prayerful request of old Trinity Lutherans who had relocated from St. Louis to Ferndale. And it is true, even when it's December, and it's cold in this studio. Are you cold? I'm freezing. <laughs> Whether you're within earshot of the radio waves broadcasting over AM 850 in St. Louis, or you're tuning in somewhere else via the KFUO radio app or on your favorite podcast podcast app, however you're tuning in, thank you for doing so. And you know, I want you to know, you can get in, in touch with me by dropping me a line at stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S ferndale.com slash contact. I'd love to hear from you on anything related to the goal of the show. What is the goal of this show? To equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul all with God's word. <laughs> right. Well, wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it that right after last week's episode on Sunday school and, and uh, home catechism, and I kind of comparing and contrasting those things uh, as we try to help Kelsey with her question to the show. Thank you, Kelsey, for writing in again. Uh, wouldn't you know it that I check the mail, and by I, I mean my wife, brings home the mail. We don't have street delivery here in the small town of Ferndale. She goes to the post office. She brings home the Luther Classical College mailer. And the article says, teaching at home, not if, but how, written by Reverend David Bukes. Uh, and he is a pastor at Concordia Lutheran Church in Fairhaven, Minnesota, a supporting congregation of Luther Classical College. So Luther Classical College is a, a, a college that's starting up in 2025. If you don't know about this, go to lutherclassical.org for more information. Great stuff happening there in uh, Casper, Wyoming, and throughout the Wyoming district, starting a new college. Yes, yes, we are building the future, not just watching it collapse. They're doing great stuff out there. I wanted to point this out to you, though, because it is exactly what we were saying last week on the show, and I thought I'd read portions of this to you so you could hear it from another pastor in the Missouri Synod, another faithful pastor who's trying to say the same thing, and uh, well, not trying, but is saying the same thing, and doing it right here on uh, the Luther Classical College mailer. So he says here that, he says, entertain a thought experiment with me. <laughs> Consider a typical Lutheran parish in the Midwest, or even out here on the Lost Coast. Worship is followed by Sunday school for the kids and Bible class for the adults. Maybe there's a weekday Bible study, and on Wednesday afternoon during the school year, there, there might be confirmation. Attendance is fairly dutiful, at least for Sunday school and confirmation. In fact, even when families miss Sunday worship or don't stick around for Bible class, they'll drop their kids off for Sunday school and consider confirmation attendance non-negotiable. Isn't that what I said? Parents dropping their kids off at Sunday school and then taking a, taking a break, going out, having a little, uh, little brunch or something, and then coming back after the services and, and the Sunday school are done and picking up their, uh, their tykes. Now suppose that one day Sunday school and confirmation disappear. How would parents react? How would you react? Great question. Great question, Pastor. Well, that frees up some time on the calendar, you might say. Wait, when are my kids going to get to socialize with other kids at church? That was the question. Uh, as Kelsey was asking it, she was, she was concerned about the socialization of her children and having them around other Christians. How are my kids going to learn the catechism, you might ask? 
I had to memorize it. Somebody should make them memorize it too. Who's going to teach my kids what to believe? Now, underlying the most likely reactions is a faulty premise. It's the idea that what goes on in Sunday school and confirmation is a unique and churchy thing. It's the idea that learning the faith is something that happens in the classroom at the behest of the pastor. It's the strange and senseless idea that the home is not the primary place for catechesis. We belie that premise even in asking the question whether catechesis should take place at home or in the church. The reality is catechesis does take place at home. It's not a question of if, but how. I'm going to not read this whole thing to you. I'll let you do that. If you want to get a copy, I'm sure they can supply it to you at lutherclassicalcollege.org. But I am going to jump to this. Moses taught the people of Israel to observe the Passover, and he knew that their observance would give way to catechesis. Quote, when in time to come your sons ask you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery, Exodus 13, 14 and following. Later at the border of the promised land, Moses instructed the people to paste their lives over with God's commands. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, 6 6-9. That's what we quoted last week as we were looking at this along with Ephesians 6, 4. Then, just as with the Passover, Moses anticipates that lives and homes so decorated with God's word will give rise to questions. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that our Lord God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Deuteronomy 6.20 and following. Notice who's asking the question, the son, who's answering the question, the father. To raise up a generation of godly offspring, Malachi 2.15, faithful parents should live faithful lives and recognize that they are catechizing their children in every moment. Oh, thank you, Pastor Bukes. They should expect that their faithfulness will lead their children to wonder why they're so different from the world. Do your kids wonder why they're different from the world? Do they even know they're different from the world? Honest question. They should be prepared to answer the questions that are raised by such faithful living. And when they fear that they are unprepared, that this is the parents, they should devote themselves to the scriptures and to the catechism, and they should seek the counsel of their pastor, who would love to help them learn to teach their children the faith. Yes, we do love that. We will help you. And that's what this entire show is about today, is teaching parents and all of the church that parents matter. But the church isn't here to take over your job, your vocation, but to encourage you and support you in it. That was the point of last week's episode. That's the point of this week's episode. I'm so happy that I got this mailer uh, just after after uh, last week's cross defense. He concludes by saying, it is not to the Sunday school teacher or the confirmation instructor that God has given the responsibility of training up children in the way they should go, Proverbs 22, 6. But neither is it to them that God has given the promises and blessings attendant to teaching your children the faith. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Proverbs 23, 24 to 25. Praise God that he has given this glorious work to parents and that he himself has promised to bless it. God grant us grace to gladly and diligently undertake this responsibility. (laughs) Good stuff. Great stuff, I should say. Great stuff. And so with that, let's go further into today's show. There is a, uh, a great quote. A great quote attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola. You might know this. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. As is apparent 
from the quote, it has to do with the consequences of what we teach our children. As Pastor Bukes pointed out with the Proverbs quotes there, this is why we care so much about what our children are learning. This is why we denounce LGBTQ books and curricula being taught to kids in day schools, in kindergartens, why we denounce drag queen story hour in libraries for kids who should be learning Dr. Seuss rhymes and singing the wheels on the bus go round and round, not the hair on the drag queen goes up and up. This is a real thing. I could show you the clip if you want. I'll spare you. This is why we denounce these things, because we care what is entering our children's minds. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. Mm. This is what God is saying in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We trust this. It's the word of God, and we, we take it seriously. We take the, our role in it, our, our participation in this promise from God seriously too. Does it mean that every child raised by Christian parents will stay the course as an adult and and be Christian? No, no, sadly, we are individuals who are not only inheritors of original sin, but we ourselves have active sin. We actually commit our own sins. We are responsible for our own faith. And so people can and do reject the truth, even when they come from good Christian homes. We can turn away from what is good. Can you hear Paul's instruction? Echoing Proverbs 22, 6. Paul, Paul's instruction to, to Pastor Timothy, 2 Timothy. Can you hear it in the background? Do you know what verse I'm referring to? Well, never fear. I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> Don't stress out. Here we go. This is what Paul says to Timothy. But as for you, and he's writing to the man, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood, from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So remember from how childhood, from childhood, you've been acquainted with the Bible from the scriptures and who taught it to you. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 is that which I was just reading. So, Paul is teaching the man Timothy to remember his upbringing because it was good and faithful. He was taught the word of God. If Timothy wasn't raised by Christians, if he was an adult convert, Paul would have been saying the opposite, right? He would have just said, look to me now as your example, as as he says in the beginning leading up to that. He was pointing out how Timothy's been a participant with Paul in, in what he's witnessed. But he wouldn't tell him to refer back to his Christian upbringing if he wasn't raised a Christian. The prevailing norm is that faithful training results in a faithful outcome, a faithful Christian adult. Train a kid to be a Christian. The general rule is he's going to be a Christian when he's an adult. Odds are in your favor that way. And we can get to some some statistics. I have another book here, a great resource that has some, uh, the date, the studies are kind of getting dated now as time goes on, but, uh, they, they get to the example. We'll see if we can get to that by the end of the, the show. They, they prove the point. But the rule is, Proverbs 22, 6, if you raise your kid up in the word, he'll stay in the word as a, as a general rule of thumb. The opposite is true too. Unfaithful training begets unfaithful adults. It leads to adults who are themselves unfaithful to God. They, they're godless. They don't know God. They've never been taught who their father is. They've never been taught who their Savior is, Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Which, by the way, let me say, because this is the kind of topic that can really burden consciences. If you are a parent whose opportunity to raise your children in the faith has already passed, your kids are grown, and they're out of the house or almost out of the house, and and you're, you're looking at this, you're listening to this, and you're going, oh, no, I didn't do it right. This is where the gospel is for your heart. Okay, you messed that up. You missed it. You sinned. 
you are forgiven by the blood of Christ. This is something that we repent of and turn back to the cross if that time has already passed. If if you're still in the midst, as Kelsey from last week's episode, as we were giving her some pastoral instruction, she's her child is three years old. She still has time, right? She can live this out. She can she can be faithful. But if that is not the case for you, just repent of your sin. Don't let the devil burden your conscience. You are forgiven, my friend. You are forgiven. By the blood of Christ on the cross, you are forgiven. Walk and support those who are still raising up their children. Be that faithful Christian who encourages them, teaches them by by what you've learned, teaches them how important it is to do these things when you have the opportunity. Blessings be to you from Christ on the cross. Okay, so in the last episode, that was November 26th, this last one I keep referring to, we discussed Sunday school. And we discussed it in context of shrinking churches, you know, church attendance getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the, the amount of kids in church getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we contrasted Robert Reikes, who's the father of the Sunday school movement, we, we contrasted his methodology, how he approached a godless society where more and more people didn't know the faith. We contrasted that with Martin Luther's familial emphasis found in the large and small catechism. And that's, that's what this mailer from uh, Pastor Bukes and from Lutheran class college, classical college is getting at too. The, the Lutheran methodology of the catechism is a home-based, it's a homeschooling methodology. We teach our children daily. And so then Sunday school becomes a supplement, like taking vitamins. It, you can't take vitamins as your meal, but you can take vitamins to supplement the nutrients of the meal, to add to it, to get the things that you might be skipping out on or missing or didn't know you were missing, right? In that way, Sunday school is a blessing. It's not meant to be a replacement. It does not escape my attention that a critique of Sunday school may shock some cross-defense listeners. It is, after all, the cultural norm in our contemporary Lutheran Protestant even context, the, the broader Protestant church. Neither is it lost on me that some cross-defense listeners who know that Lutherans have a highly prized emphasis on Christian education of our young, that we have a rich heritage of pri- prioritizing our kids' education. We, you know, The LCMS runs the, the largest parochial school system outside of the Roman Catholics here in the United States, and, and many of you know that. And you may therefore appreciate some more information on the topic of Christian education, this stuff from Pastor Bukes and and everything else I'm about to tell you after this break. Let's take a break. (laughs) We'll be right back for segments two and three of today's Cross Defense. Thanks for listening. Every Sunday at 9.30 a.m., you are invited to dig into the scriptures with God's people at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in De Pere, Missouri. This in-depth Bible class goes verse by verse through the scriptures, pointing out the meaning of the text and its application for Christians today. Recordings of prior classes are available on kfuo.org. Grow in your knowledge and understanding of scripture every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime, anywhere. I'd like to share with you the reaction of a devout Christian here at St. Mark, his reaction after listening to last week's episode on Sunday school and the the familial responsibility of, of educating our children that all that we need, all that's needful is the word of God and, and that that is handed over, handed down, traditioned, the handing down of it most powerfully by mom and dad. This man was raised in a boy's home. He didn't have the blessing of parents to train him up in the word of the Lord. They didn't do their their job. Yet, it was when he was a child that the Holy Spirit worked faith in his heart. It was then. And where did that happen? It happened in Sunday school. 
It happened just as Robert Reikies envisioned it. This is as close to a textbook execution of the goal of the Sunday School movement as Robert Reikies envisioned that we'll ever find, a way of training children in the way of the Lord who would otherwise not receive such training. This is a blessing. And this man here at St. Mark, he even has the Bible he received during, uh, during Sunday school, during that time of his life. He has a 58-year-old Bible to remind him of the glorious grace of God, the love of his Father in heaven that was shown to him, shown to him through his Sunday school experience. I've had the privilege of holding this Bible. He's shown it to me. He's handed it to me. I've flipped to the pages. I appreciate this artifact because it does speak volumes, volumes to the mercy of our Father in heaven that he overcomes the sins of parents. Yes, none of us are stuck in the the pathologies, in in the, the, the ways, the roads, the ruts that our parents instill in us by their action or inaction. None of us are stuck in that. And this man is case in point that Sunday school is a blessing. It's a blessing, especially for those it's intended for. But we don't often think that Sunday school is intended for those without parents. We actually treat it as if it's the norm for all kids, as we heard from Pastor Bukes in the mailer in the first segment. So many people think Sunday school and church, you know, it's churchy stuff that is supposed to be handled by the pastor and and Sunday school teachers, but not at home. And that's what we're trying to counter. That's the idea we're trying to rebut. See, this, this spiritual care of spiritually neglected children, the Sunday school idea, is in keeping with scripture. It's one way of skinning the cat. And it's why the church has pastoral helpers, we call them elders, who were originally set aside to serve people who are not in the normal situation of the congregation. And I'm particularly focused here now on widows, but I'll get back to how it relates to to orphans, to those who are not being trained up by their parents in just a moment. But in Acts 6, 1 to 7, we see the origin of an office created that serves those not in the normal situation situation. And what was that? The widow. The widow didn't have a husband anymore to serve her, to provide for her, to to care for her, to think about her needs before his own. That's what a husband's supposed to do. So the church, the apostolic church set up an office of men of good repute, full of the spirit and full of wisdom, Acts 6.3, to serve these widows. Because now they were in this this special category. There was something missing from their normal life that needed to be supplemented, taken care of in in a unique way by the church. And so this is what happened. Maybe your congregation still has this emphasis for elders. Praise be to God if it does. But unfortunately, many of our congregations today have lost this emphasis, this particular emphasis when Uh, for the elder, when the suffrage movement entered into our synod and the family unity, the cohesiveness of the family, the the centrality that the church is built up, uh, not of individuals, but of families who come together. And the family then is made up of individuals. It took a blow from the, the very American focus on individuality as that was set up over and against family units the nuclear family. And no longer was there a need for the church to raise up servants whose duty it was to take care of widows. No longer. To make sure the voiceless had a voice. So the emphasis shifted. There was now seen, uh, the individual was seen as able to take care of herself. She didn't need anybody to help with that. So James one twenty seven links the widow situation to the the orphan situation, even if it's just a spiritual orphan, even if his parents are physically there, but they're neglecting teaching the child 
spiritually the Word of God. James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. See, in this way, the Sunday school model does a great thing as a service to children who are not receiving a Christian upbringing. However, as I said in the last episode, Sunday school is an abused blessing when it's used as an opportunity, that is, temptation, for otherwise faithful parents to abdicate their parental duty of raising their children to be Christian. Pastors across the Synod, and I suspect across Christendom, can testify that this is the prevailing situation today. We see the biblical ignorance of the youth coming through Sunday school, confirmation, these sorts of things. Pastors can see the ignorance of Christian children. They're not knowing. Ignorance isn't a negative word. It's not a derogatory word. It just means to not know that these children do not know. Christian children who have been in Sunday school their whole lives. Pastors recognize that they often have a very limited biblical literacy. Something is wrong. They should know more by the time they get to confirmation class. And they don't. Why is that? Because so many parents are relying on Sunday school and, and just being in the divine service, confirmation class. They're relying on these things to teach their kids the faith. Rather than daily modeling, living out the faith, teaching their children the answers to the questions they have, explaining to them the glories of God when they have these questions, when the world and the devil and the sinful flesh are bombarding them with doubt and lies. The parents aren't equipped to combat it. And they're just hoping and expecting one hour in Sunday school and an hour in the, the divine service to, let's call it three hours a week, is going to be enough to combat the however many hours are in the week. What's, the, what's that figure out? How many hours are left in the week that the devil is catechizing our children, that the world is catechizing them because the parents aren't doing it. They think they're getting enough just by taking their kids to school. And so the, all of us pastors are recognizing this problem. We see it firsthand, and we're doing our best to counter it, to say, parents, you matter. Catechism happens at home. As Pastor Buke said, uh, it's not if, but how you're teaching your children at home. Because even if you're not teaching them the Bible, what are you teaching them? You're teaching them that the Bible doesn't matter. You're teaching them that God doesn't really matter. And for, for fathers especially, as we will, if we can get to this next book I have to share with you, Family Vocation by Gene Veith and Mary Merby. Fathers, your role is especially important. So let's keep moving toward that, okay? Um, in the midst of this self-destruction, of this, this whole negative situation, there are children in our congregations with wonderful parents who would, would raise up their kids properly if they realized more acutely, more sharply, more clearly just what the parental responsibility that they had was, what it entailed. Many parents just don't know. They think this is normal because the church has been living in this Sunday school culture and living in this once a week sort of obligatory arrival, at least through confirmation. And then as soon as the kid is done with confirmation, we graduated, we never go back to church again. The whole family disappears. We've been living in this system for centuries. For a long time now, a couple hundred years, this has been the, the case. The Sunday school movement has built up, and, and we just think it's normal. So there are parents who, if someone would bother to tell them that there is the home catechetical model, that it's better than the Sunday school model, that the Sunday school model should just supplement, not replace, home catechesis, they would, they would love that. They just want to know. And that's what we want to communicate to the church. Sunday school is not a substitute for mom and dad, just as elders are not substitutes for husbands, for the widows. 
Both are simply the church working out a solution to problems encountered because we live in a sinful world and we ourselves are sinners. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of people who are the exceptions to the rule because of the brokenness of the world we live in. And just as we don't ever want to create a situation where the church is dividing husbands and wives, we don't want to aid and abet parents in in the sin of abandoning their duty to teach their children the Christian faith. We don't want to become the temptation, woe to you who leads the little one into sin. We don't want to do that. So the same way more parents are today homeschooling their kids because the public schools are no longer serving the family and they're in complete uh, contrast and hostile even to parental authority and parental values for kids, Christian kids especially, Uh, The same way Christian parents are now homeschooling, we need Christian parents to return to an active role in teaching their children the faith, daily modeling and catechizing, praying with their kids, praying for their kids, studying scripture with their kids, studying scripture for their kids to be able to know the answers to their questions, preparing for those hard questions, discussing what it is that the word says at every opportunity, as Deuteronomy 6 says. The church serves the family in this endeavor. It doesn't take it over. It doesn't replace the family. It serves the family. We are to encourage one another, not replace one another. And so we want to encourage fathers and mothers in their parental work. It is the best work there is. And in fact, you guys, you guys truly are the solution to our society's ills. You truly are the solution to what ails our society. My friends, you may wonder just how extreme this situation is. You may wonder why, why is Pastor Brown making such a big deal about this right now? Or maybe you've heard it even, you know, emphasized even more emphatically by, by your own pastor. Why does my pastor care so much? Two reasons. First, because it's part of the pastoral vocation. It's what we do. We care about people. We care about you. We care about your kids. We care about the kids who are yet to come, our future neighbors. We care about strangers, our neighbors in, in society that we don't even know. I wouldn't recognize from Adam, all the different people who you know fill our communities. We care about them. And we recognize that church, the churching of the family is the solution. So first, we care because it's part of our vocation. As CFW Walther said, the preacher should care in a heartfelt way for the youth in his congregation. Be serious about this group of Christ's sheep who stand in special danger, as I said last week, the youth are the most vulnerable among us simply because of their lack of experience with the world. And now, especially as the world has set its sights on the youth, all of our media, all of our culture, everything is focused on, on indoctrinating your kids, teaching them the ways of the world. And so we are, as pastors, to keep a watchful eye on the children as much as we do for the parents. Walther continues, the pastor should institute regular church examination, do everything he can so that the youth willingly attend that examination and see that they regularly attend worship too, that they diligently use confession, that kids confess their sins, and that they use the Holy Supper, and they regularly announce for the Holy Supper themselves. They want, the kids want to take it. And they know why, not just because mom and dad are dragging them to church, but because they themselves know they need it. The pastor is to make sure that they do not attend the worship service of false believers. Don't be going to those other churches out there, those heterodox churches that are teaching falsely. You're susceptible. You're going to, you're going to be thinking about your peers and, and what everybody else is doing. You're not going to be critiquing. Kids aren't, aren't the sharpest in critiquing the theology of what's going on, nor should they be expected to be. And so we want to guard them from that until they can discern for themselves what's wrong with it. Pastors are to make sure that they avoid seductive society and, and dangerous get-togethers in public or in private. Also dishonorable or even indecent games, Proverbs 7.13, and that they, the kids, avoid attending theater, public dances, circuses, and such. You might be, what what is going on? They can't go to theater, public dances, circuses? Well, if you're wondering about this, just think about why you don't want your kids watching Disney anymore. Walter has a document he wrote against uh, theater and public dances. We'll critique that here coming up soon, just like we did the his uh, his 
lectures on communism and Marxism. He has one on theater and dance. And it's basically because the, what you know to be true, the entertainment industry is corrupting your children's minds. The, you know, that light year has a lesbian kiss in it makes you not want your kids to watch Disney. That's what Walter's saying. And this is what we've always known. We've just let our guard down. Okay. So uh, we want to do that. What else does he say? He continues, uh, they do not join godless clubs. We want to make sure they're not joining godless clubs or those that would be dangerous because of their inexperience and immaturity. If they do not fall upon soul poisoning reading, such as godless newspapers. And he references that in his lectures of communism, on communism. Uh, obscene novels and stories or dramatic works of this sort of nature, doctrinally erring or naturalistic writings and the like. This is all from his, uh, his work called Pastoral Theology. Okay, pastors care about the spiritual well-being of the children in the congregation because they are souls that he will one day answer for. He is, has been given charge by the command and authority of God, Christ, to treat these children as Christ treats them, meaning to guard them from the wolves in the world. These little lambs mean so much to our Lord. The second reason I and other pastors care so much about this, the second reason you should care so much about this, that parents should care so much about this, is because, to put, put it quite simply, the root of the problem of all the issues, all the issues that we're dealing with in our society today can be found in the parental education of responsibility. Christians not raising up their children to be Christians. This is the root of all the evils in our world today, in our society here in America, in the Western world. Parents aren't being parents. All right, we'll talk more about that <laughs> in just a second. Let's take a break. Hold on, and we'll get right back into it. Family, end-of-life issues, procreation, health, human suffering. These are the issues you or your loved ones have or will face in life. I'm Stephanie Jabauer. I invite you to join me and other Friends for Life in a community where the people of God share His Word and their experiences on life issues. Friends for Life, an LCMS partner podcast of KFUO with new episodes on the second and fourth Fridays. Find us on your favorite podcast platform and the KFUO app. It is true. The root problem in our society is the destruction of the family. The destruction of the Christian family. Want to solve gun violence? We've been seeing a lot of that in the news, haven't we? The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and therefore repeat the cycle. Want to put an end to the physical, emotional, and spiritual damage being done to our neighbors by the LGBTQ purveyors? The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. Want less corrupt politician? politicians? The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. Want to see the divorce rate obliterated to near non-existence? The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. Want to end abortion? The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to, end, to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. You get it? The answer to all the problems in our society is Christian parenting. Want to solve the homeless, homelessness problem? You got it. Christian parents need to raise Christian children to be Christian parents and repeat the cycle. Looking for a permanent solution to the inflation that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, inflation, unemployment, financial burdens. Truly, the answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. Drugs, same thing. Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents repeating the cycle. Rape, Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the, repeating the cycle. Creed, you get it. The answer is Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents. That's the answer. That's broken. That's broken. And too many parents think that being a Christian parent means simply dropping off your kids at Sunday school. No. 
Being a Christian parent means raising up your children in the church. You yourself being active in the church means, that means you're also active in your faith at home. That it's not just a compartmentalized thing you do for one hour out of obligation, but that your kids can see that you joyfully want to be a Christian, that you do it willingly, that you're not being, you know, your arms being twisted, forcing you to do something you don't really want to do, but you're doing begrudgingly acts like so many fathers do these days. The wives drag them to church. They go because they feel a sense of uh, you know, obligation because they were, they were raised that way. And so they get their kids through confirmation and then it's like, whoa, I'm glad that's over. No more church. Kids see these things and they can recognize your motivation. They may not be able to articulate it and you can probably try to twist it, but they are picking up on the cues. Your, your lifestyle is shaping them. So Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents means active engagement in God's word. Where Christ has promised, that word is going to be faithfully preached and taught in the scripture, in the, in the divine service. That's where the scriptures are faithfully preached and taught. Where they were long before we had the printing press, long before everybody had a Bible in their home and in their phone, in their pocket, they would come and they would hear God's word proclaimed, preached, read, out loud. They would come and they would receive communion. They would bring their children to the font to be baptized. They themselves would come to the font to be baptized when they were converted as adults. All these things. Church. And then it radiates out. Church. Out. Church. It shapes us. Daily, not weekly. Daily. After teaching at length about the honor kids are commanded to give their parents in the fourth commandment, Luther concludes in the large catechism by turning to the parents. Now listen to what Luther has to say to us parents. And even if you're not a parent, listen to this because this is going to help you serve your neighbor who is. Okay? Listen to how you as a church member, a Christian, equip your mind to be able to serve those who are in this vocation because it is such a paramount part of solving our societal problems and and ensuring that people are saved by the blood of Christ. They know the gospel. So this is what Luther says to parents. It would also be well to preach to parents on the nature of their responsibility, how they should treat those who whom they have been appointed to rule. And he's going to be talking to parents. And in the fourth commandment, he also deals with subjects and servants. So employees, these sorts of things. Anyone where you have a fatherly influence on, you're an authority of. Okay. So although their responsibility is not explicitly presented in the Ten Commandments, it is certainly treated in detail in many other passages of Scripture. God even intends it to be included precisely in this commandment in which he speaks of father and mother. For he does not want scoundrels or tyrants in this office of parent or in any authority, nor does he assign them this honor, that is, power and right to govern, so that they may receive homage. He's not giving you the the office of parent so that you can be praised as dad. No. Instead, parents should keep in mind, Luther says, that they owe obedience to God. And that above all, they should earnestly and faithfully discharge the duties of their office, not only to provide for the material support of their children, servants and subjects, but especially to bring them up to the praise and honor of God. Therefore, do not imagine that the parental office is a matter of your pleasure and your whim. It is a strict commandment and injunction of God who holds you accountable for it. Strong words from Luther, right? But let me repeat this part again, because this is where most parents are in America. We are mostly concerned with material support of the children. Not only, Luther says, are we supposed to be providing for the material support of their children, but especially to bring them up in the praise and honor of God. It is not enough, dads especially, but moms too, all of us. It is not enough to put clothing on your kid's back, 
to put food on their table. That is a cop-out. If you think you can go off to work, bring home the, the bacon, and expect mom to be the one who is taking care of the spiritual well-being of the children because you, dad, represent the father in heaven, the masculine father. And so it is to you that the kids shaping their formation has been given. And statistically speaking, you are the most influential person in their lives on the spiritual spectrum. And I suspect on all matters, they, they may be closer to mom because they spend more time with her or something like that because you're at work, but you are more influential when it comes to the spirituality of your children. Luther continues, but once again, the real trouble is that no one perceives or pays attention to this reality. Everyone acts as if God gave us children for our own, our own pleasure and amusement, gave us servants merely to put them to work like cows or donkeys, and gave us subjects to treat as we please, as if it were no concern of ours what they learn or how they live. No one is willing to see that this is the command of the divine majesty who will solemnly call us to account and punish us for its neglect. Now get this, nor is it recognized how very necessary it is to devote serious attention to the young. For if we want capable and qualified people for both the civil and the spiritual realms, we really must spare no effort, no time, and no expense in teaching and educating our children to serve God and the world. That's powerful too. We must not think only of amassing money and property for our children. God can provide for them and make them rich without our help, as indeed he does daily. But he has given us children and entrusted them to us precisely so that we may raise and govern them according to his will. Otherwise, God would have no need of fathers and mothers. Mom, Dad, your one job, your one job is to raise your children to fear the Lord. That is to have faith in God. That they go to heaven is your one concern that they live in the new heavens and the new earth in imperishable bodies forever without sin, without death, without heartache and pain, without any of the things that sin brought into this world. That is your aim. That and that alone. God will take care of their earthly needs just as he takes care of yours. He has called you into a vocation to participate. He delights in you participating with him in teaching these neighbors of yours that he has given you, your children, they are your closest neighbors. He delights in letting you participate in giving them eternal life with Christ, bringing them up to know they are forgiven, bringing them up to know what the law is so they don't continue to sin without repentance. Therefore, Luther says, let all people know that it is their chief duty at the risk of losing divine grace, first to bring up their children in the fear and knowledge of God, and then, if they are so gifted, also to have them engage in formal study and learn so that they may be of service wherever they are needed. So first comes their faith, then comes their earthly service. And Luther will go on in another place to talk about how kids should stay in school to learn to become pastors, <laughs> primarily, because they were breaking from the monastic system where people would send their kids off to school to be monks. And so now that the gospel is reigning and people are no longer going into nunneries and, and convents and these sorts of things. So many people are like, oh, my kid doesn't need to go to school anymore. And he's like, whoa, wait. Your kid can be a service to the world, to his neighbor, if he knows God's word, if he learns about it, and if he learns at, at depth about it, and as, as well as math and, and history and writing, all these other 
talents that we use to give God's grace to people. So he says, keep your kids in school. In this day and age, that's homeschool or a good parochial school, good private school. I wouldn't say leave them in public school because that is a hostile pit. Get them out as fast as possible. Luther continues, if this were done, if we were truly putting our kids' faith first and then encouraging them to use their gifts and to, to harness their gifts and talents in service to their neighbor, if this were done, God would also bless us richly and give us grace so that people might be trained who would be a credit to the nation and its people. See? Ah, to the nation and its people. So if we put our kids' faith first, stop worrying about how many toys they have, what iPhone they're wearing or using, what clothes they're wearing. They don't wear iPhones. What clothes they're wearing, these sorts of things. If we stop worrying about the material goods and we start worrying about their faith, and that's our, because that's our responsibility, we then will bless not only them, but their families, their, their circle of neighbors, and indeed to the nation and all people. We would also, Luther says, have good, capable citizens, virtuous women who, as good managers of the household, Titus 2.5, would faithfully raise upright children and servants. What was it I said at the beginning of this segment? What's the solution to all of our society's problems? Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeating the cycle. As the virtuous women who will grow up to be good managers of the household, Titus 2.5, would faithfully raise up upright children and servants, parents, fathers too, as fathers are taking care of mom and kid. Think, Luther says, what deadly harm you do when you are negligent and fail to bring up your children to be useful and godly. You bring upon yourself sin and wrath, thus earning hell by the way you have reared your own children, no matter how holy and upright you may be otherwise. Because this commandment is neglected, God also terribly punishes the world. Hence, there is no longer any discipline, government, or peace. We all complain about this situation, but we fail to see that it is our own fault. We have unruly and disobedient, disobedient subjects because of how we train them. That's all Luther's saying that. It sounds like he's talking about our day and age, isn't it? We no longer have any discipline, government, or peace. And we complain about this situation. We see it all the time. We complain about it. We grumble. We commiserate, commiserate with one another. But we fail to see that it's our own fault. That if we only would take our jobs seriously and do the things we've been given to do rather than the things we want to do, if we would grow up and stop being in a perpetual adolescence as we have been since the end of World War II, as we've raised up all these people who are self-serving, if we would stop that, we could return to some discipline. We'd have good government again. We'd have peace. Our nation, our society would be healed as we have Christian parents raising Christian children to be Christian parents and repeat. Luther says this is enough to serve as a warning. A more ex extensive explanation, he says, will be, will be given later, and he writes about it later. See, we all see what's going on in the world. All the violence, the perversion, the hatred, the greed, the insolence, the lawlessness, all of it, etc., etc., etc. The source goes back to the family. Parents relinquishing their vocational responsibility, failing to carry out their calling. This, this is why parents matter. So much more than you think. Parents are the solution to the, the small problems and the major ones. The church is here to support you, mom, support you, dad, in what you do. We're not going to have enough time to get to family vocation, this other book I have for us to look at. Uh, family vocation, God's calling in marriage, parenting, and childhood. I'll put a link up to it uh, on the show notes. Uh, this is by Gene Edward Veith Jr. and Mary Maraby. But there's a great sec section in here talking about fatherless children. And the role fathers have, especially moms too. There's a section in here about moms, but especially hard hitting is the one about fathers. And there's some wonderful grace in there too. There's grace in all the things we see. And I want to return to that now. 
because there's some hard words here. And for many of you who perhaps don't have the opportunity to, to fix your parenting decisions, you can repent of them. And the gospel still prevails for you. Christ died for your sins, period. Repent of them. Trust in his mercy. Trust your father loves you. And trust, like the dear man here at St. Mark, that God is bigger than you. He's bigger than parents. He can and he does save people apart from mothers and fathers. He does use Sunday schools. He uses orphanages and boys' homes. He uses all kinds of things. Many of us, even in the ministry today, weren't raised up in the church, and yet here we are. God is bigger. That's what I meant when I said we're not stuck in certain pathological ruts. Proverbs 22.6 isn't you know, a silver bullet. Christian children can be raised up and and not stay true to the faith, and non-Christian parents or parents who are Christian in name only or who are currently shirking their responsibility, they can be blessed with children who grow up to be faithful Christians. Our God is that big. He's that gracious. All that is not to say we don't care about parenting. We care tremendously, as I hope you have learned from this last hour, and we're to take our jobs very seriously. All right, guys. Well, it's been great spending some time with you this hour. Parents, you matter. That's the point of today's show. That's what I want you to get from this. Thank you so much, Luther Classical College, for sending this out so timely, uh, given the cross defense that just came out last week. And so thanks to you listeners for getting a sort of an impromptu part two. Uh, I love when that happens. So God's blessings to you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. We'll talk to you in the next episode. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.